one second. go. Oh, snap. There we go. So today we're going to be talking about the three different types, of, or not three, the types of different co-crystals, so there's different categories, what classifies as a co-crystal. And again, we'll be tailor, tailoring this to what we refer to as APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients. And just to let you know, I'm a crystallographer not a pharmaceutical chemist so I'm just giving you the fundamentals but if you want to know more in depth about the pharmaceutical side of it then I recommend taking the pharmaceutical course that's offered with with professors who know more about that aspect so my aspect is more of the crystallography side not the pharmaceutical side to say and so cold crystals is used quite a bit in uh, uh, X-ray crystallography, there's a branch called crystal engineering where we take different molecules or different entities and try to engineer certain types of motifs, maybe for drug delivery or to make better solubility of the drug. And so it's a widely used practice to generate co-crystals. And so what is the definition of a co-crystal? And so... <clears throat> I mean, as you can read the first bullet, it kind of explains it. So we have a solid that has at least two or more different types of molecular ionic compounds in some stoichiometric ratio in the asymmetric unit. So when you do when you solve the asymmetric unit, you're going to have multiple different types of molecular compounds or ionic compounds, and they they they. Uh, classified as compounds because if you have a solvent, usually that's referred to as a solvate, which could be, you know, explained as a co-crystal as well, but that's a special type which is referred to as solvates when solvent crystallizes in the lattice or simple salts. And so the reason I wanted to show you the FDA's uh, definition of a co-crystal is because this is what uh, people have to abide by when they issue patents for different types of drug designs. So the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration, which kind of oversees uh, drugs that enter the market. And so from the FDA's point of view, it's two or more molecules in the same crystal lattice. So you have this solid with two or more molecules, and it's in the same crystal lattice, so therefore it's a co-crystal. And so this limits co-crystals to molecular components. Now, a pharmaceutical co-crystal means that at least one of the different uh, components or conformers in the asymmetric unit is an API or an active pharmaceutical ingredient, and the other one is pharmaceutically acceptable. So that means it's, you know, it could be a solvent, it could be another type of drug, etc. And so again, API stands for active pharmaceutical ingredient. And so one such type of pharmaceutical co-crystal that I have over here on the um, uh, right involves this drug carbamazepine and paraminobenzoic acid. And this drug here, which we'll see what its properties are in just a second, but it was co-crystallized with this uh, paraminobenzoic acid to enhance its solubility in water. And so this drug by itself has very limited solubility, but when you co-crystallize it with paraminobenzoic acid, it, in, it increases its solubility uh, properties. And so when we try to enhance physical properties of APIs, this could be solubility or its stability, so its shelf life can remain on the shelf longer. Bioavailability, so how well it's transferred into the body and also mechanical properties. So these are all examples of properties that we try to enhance when we make a pharmaceutical co-crystal.
And so there are different ways we can enhance APIs. And the first way is we try to uh, make a co-crystal. And there's going to be different types of ways of enhancement. But here, a co-crystal, we try to crystallize uh, two or more molecules in the same crystal lattice. So what I have here in the first part for each one is the asymmetric unit. And then I have the packing diagram. So the first one on your left is uh, carbamazepine and paraminobenzoic acid. One second. One second. So carbamazepine and benzoic acid is shown here. And again, the reason they wanted to co-crystallize this uh, a benzoic acid derivative with the drug was to increase its solubility. And just to let you know, it's, uh, it's crystallized in the space group C2 upon C. And so what you're looking at below it is the packing diagram. And so in red is paraminobenzoic acid, in blue is the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And what happens is you see that the paraminobenzoic acid if I circle it in for you, you can kind of see it better. Right here, it is, if you see, there's like a little dash between them. It hydrogen bonds with itself and it forms this dimer. And then the, so the benzoic acid part of the paramino benzoic acid, hydrogen bonds and forms this, what we call a carboxylic dimer. And then the amine part, the NH2, hydrogen bonds with the drug. So that's the interaction that's going on between the drug and the uh, carboxylic acid. Now the drug itself forms a dimer as well, which is shown here between the NH2 and the OH, the carboxylic groups on the, uh, or the, excuse me, the carbonyl group on the drug. So hydrogen bonding is a major role, uh, it plays a major role in stabilizing crystal structures of co-crystals involving carboxylic acids and amines. So again, hydrogen bonding is when you have a hydrogen attached to an oxygen or nitrogen, and it can expand on that as well, that uh, interacts with a oxygen or nitrogen on another molecule, and that's a hydrogen bond. And it's a very predominant intermolecular force that's used in forming co-crystals. Now, on the other, other side, I just wanted to show you, you know, it's not always drugs that you can form co-crystals with. You can even do it to kind of engineer certain types of crystalline motifs. And so here what we have on the right-hand side is what's called diodotetrafluorobenzene or paradiodotetrafluorobenzene and we have a, a very large nitrogen heterocycle and so what happens is there's a interaction between the iodine on the organoiodide and a nitrogen on the nitrogen heterocycle and this forms what is called a halogen bond and that's what holds those two molecules together so halogen bonding is like hydrogen bonding the only difference is instead of a hydrogen you're interacting a halogen with a nitrogen or a sulfur etc and so what happens is you get this arrangement of the packing diagram that looks like this so you form these columns of the nitrogen heterocycles. And then in the middle of these columns or channels, you have the organoiodide that halogen bonds to the nitrogen heterocycle. So this is what the packing diagram of this co-crystal would look like. And it again, it 
crystallizes in P21 upon C. So you have hydrogen bonding that's used to engineer co-crystals, and you also have halogen bonding that is used to engineer co-crystals as well. And hydrogen bonding is used, used a lot in uh, drugs that have you know carboxylic groups or amine groups because carbo uh, carboxylic acids uh, hydrogen bond strongly with those types of groups. Now, when you're looking at, for example, other types of drug interactions, say, for example, in the thyroid, you use organoiodides in the thyroid. It's one of the hormones in the thyroid is an organoiodide. And so sulfur is actually uh, would interact with the uh, iodine to form a halogen bond. And so some thyroid drugs contain sulfur in it for that purpose. So these are two main types of interactions, hydrogen bonding and halogen bonding. And iodine works the best for halogen bonding. If you go to bromine, it's okay, but after that, you know, it doesn't work as well. So iodine is the best, and iodine in this case would be a Lewis acid, and your nitrogen would be a Lewis base. And nitrogen is probably the best Lewis base uh, to use. You can also use sulfur, but sulfur is not as robust a Lewis base as a nitrogen. And then for hydrogen bonding, the Lewis acid is hydrogen. The Lewis base is going to be your carbonyl or lone pair of nitrogen on the uh, lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen or the oxygen. So that's the Lewis base. The Lewis acid is the hydrogen. So this is one way you can enhance APIs is by forming co-crystals. And if you go on the, the Cambridge Structured Database, there are numerous examples of drugs that have been co-crystallized with other types of carboxylic acids, other types of drugs, etc. And so these are just more examples of co-crystals. So uh, another co-crystal with this same drug that we've talked about, carbamazepine, it was actually co-crystallized with saccharin. And if you took Jenkin one lab, we use saccharinate, which is just the deprotonated version of saccharin. But here they co-crystallized carbamazepine It's carbamazepine, something like that, and saccharin. And the reason they did this is because they wanted to help enhance its bioavailability, and they wanted to increase its uh, solubility. So they would try to co-crystallize it with saccharin. And at the bottom, what we see is the packing diagram. And so again, since you have a amine group and a carbonyl, and you have again an, an amine and a carbonyl, there's going to be hydrogen bonding that kind of holds this co-crystal together. And so if we look again, the carbamazepine by itself forms this hydrogen bonded dimer. And then it is further stabilized by hydrogen bonding with the uh, saccharin. And so what you get is in between the dimers of carbamazepine, you have a dimer of saccharin that kind of stabilizes the co-crystal. And so here again, hydrogen bonding plays an important role. Now they give you one other example of a different drug. Here we're talking about escitalopram, which is used as an antidepressant. Its structure looks like this. And they wanted to investigate forming co-crystals of this antidepressant with different types of carboxylic acids. So if you actually read the paper, they had like, I think, 10 or 15 different carboxylic acids they used to co-crystallize with this uh, drug. And the reason they wanted to investigate uh, co-crystals of this type of drug is because they wanted to, to see the difference in 
which types of co-crystals would form, you know, racemic, the racemic form or the enantiomeric form. And the reason this is important is because the S enantiomer is the one that provides the pharmacolog pharma pharmacological effects. When the R enantiomer is present, it actually inhibits this activity. So they're trying to try different co-crystals of various types of carboxylic acids to see if there's some kind of relationship between the type of uh, carboxylic acid and the type of structure that forms. Is it the racemic form or is it an antiomeric form? And so below we see again the packing diagram and it's kind of hard to see but here's the the one involving oxalic acid it's right here and it kind of forms a bridge between two different uh, molecules of the drug and so again that amine that NH here which is protonated because remember in the unprotonated form up here there's no H but here you protonate it and it hydrogen bonds with the oxalic acid and so what you get is you get a kind of dimer that forms with the oxalic acid. So there's two of the molecules of drug for every one molecule of oxalic acid. Furthermore, the oxalic acid here actually hydrogen bonds with another oxalic acid. And what happens is you get this extended chain of oxalic acids forming like a channel between the two, the, the two or the columns of molecules of the drug. So again, they, they investigated this to see what type of forms of this drug would, would be developed if you tried different types of uh, carboxylic acids. So again, hydrogen bonding plays an important role. So what happened is the oxalic acid deprotonated on one side and it, the nitrogen here protonated to make it NH+. So you have a positive nitrogen here and you have a negative oxygen here, the balance, the charge is uh, balanced. So these are just examples of different types of co-crystals. And this is one way to enhance active pharmaceutical ingredients. Now the next way to do this is by looking at something called polymorphs. So polymorphs are the same substance, the same exact molecule, but it's just crystallized in a different uh, space group. So it's exactly the same molecular connectivity. They're exactly identical. The only difference is they've uh, crystallized in a completely different space group. And so, According to the FDA's definition, this will include uh, solvation, so solvent in the lattice, and also hydration products, and what's referred to as the amorphous forms of these types of substances. Now, here we're just going to talk about polymorphs, and so polymorphic means it crystallizes in a different uh, space group. So again, we have our drug, carbamazepine. And here are the, I knew I had it somewhere, here are the properties of what this drug is used for. So analgesic, anti-epileptic, and anti-convulsant, and used in bipolar disorder treatment. And so here we have a form of this drug which crystallizes in the space group P21 upon N. And I don't think it's form 1, I think it's actually form 2. Uh, it is. So I'm not sure about the form. I believe it's form two, not form one. And so this is the packing of this polymorph of carbamazepine shown here down the A axis. So this is what it looks like when it packs. And so as you can see right here, there is forming these hydrogen bonding dimers between the N2 and the O1. And that's what you're forming in this uh, crystal structure. Now that's one important aspect of this crystal structure. 
Another important aspect, and it's kind of hard to see, but there may be some interaction between the pi clouds of neighboring benzene rings. So they, what we call this is pi pi stacking. And so this would be face face pi pi stacking because the face of one benzene ring is interacting with the face of another benzene ring. And the way you can confirm if this is pi pi stacking This is type of interaction between benzene rings or any type of aromatic ring is that the distance between the rings is about roughly uh, less than about 3.6 ish. That's an estimation right there. So if you measure this distance and it's less than, I think it's 3.6 or 3.9, something like that, that tells you that these two pi clouds and these benzene rings are interacting with one another, which further stabilizes the crystal. Likewise, with hydrogen bonding, if you're interested in those distances, just to give you an idea, hydrogen bonding, and it's going to be slightly different for oxygen and nitrogen, but if you have an oxygen hydrogen bond, that distance is going to be typically less than 2.5, and this is angstroms we're talking about. And the way we get that is we take the radii of the van der Waals radii of oxygen and add it to the van der Waals radii of hydrogen, and we get about roughly 2.5 angstroms. And so oxygen's van der Waals radii is 1.4, Hydrogen's van der Waals radii is 1 to 1.1, depending on where you look at. So roughly 2.5 or less. Oh, snap. That's the wrong, uh, the wrong sign I've been using. It should be less than, not greater than. So less than 2.5 angstroms and less than 2.5. And so the lower it is, the stronger the interaction is. So if you had a hydrogen bond of 1.8 angstroms, that's a very strong hydrogen bond. If you had a hydrogen bond of 2.4 angstroms, that's a very weak hydrogen bond. And so these are types of intermolecular forces that stabilize the crystal. And so again, we have hydrogen bonding, we have halogen bonding, we have pi pi stacking, which is interactions between phenol rings or aromatic rings. And again, this is approximately less than 3.6 ish angstroms in that ballpark you know, around there. So the closer they are, the stronger the interaction is. Now, what they notice about this uh, particular polymorph of carbamazepine is that this C10, C11, is known to significantly alter the anti-convulsant activity. And so C10, C11 are these two carbons here. So the double bonds here are C10 and C11. And that's what they found out is by this, uh, this bond here has a, plays a part in the type of activity seen in the drugs. And just to let you know, these crystals were obtained by recrystallization of ethanol. Now, there's another form of, and there are many forms of uh, this drug. I think there's four in all. A monoclinic form, two monoclinic forms. I think there's a triclinic form, and there's one other form as well. I think a trigonal form, actually. And so another polymorph of this is form 4, which crystallizes in C2 upon C. 
So again, it has the same type of drug properties, but it was crystallized in a slightly different uh, fashion. So it was crystallized by evaporating a methanol solution of the compound in the presence of hydroxypropyl cellulose. And from this uh, solution, they actually got a mix of crystals that were needles and platelets. The platelets were the form that they were interested in, this form four. The needles were the triclinic form, which is form one. So actually when they crystallized this, uh, so this compound in this type of solution, they formed two types of crystals, needles, which was the triclinic form, form one, and the platelets, which was form four, the C-centered monoclinic form. And what they noticed is when they melted these form four crystals, it converted back into the form one. So you see you get different properties uh, from different polymorphs. Now to look at this packing of the form four down the A-axis, you see that it is different than the packing of form two down the A-axis. So these are two different types of crystal structures, but they have the same uh, molecular connectivity. So it's the same molecule, it just crystallizes uh, differently. And the reason this happens is because in crystallography, there are two types of crystal st structures. So this is an energy diagram or an energy well. So let's pretend that this is an uh, energy well. So you see we have two minimums. The first minimum, which is very quickly to get to, is sometimes referred to as the kinetic form. So the kinetic form in crystal crystallography means it's the one that crystallizes the fastest. So kinetic means it's fast in forming. Whereas you also have, in, for a crystal structure, you have the thermodynamic form, which takes longer. It's the lower energy conformation. And so typically when you do crystallization, the kinetic form is, is usually more preferred or it's not preferred, but it's what you get most of the time because it's the faster process. The thermodynamic form has to travel further until it reaches that minimum at the bottom of the energy well. And so that's why you can have multiple polymorphs depending on how it crystallizes in solution. So if you, if you change the solution, uh, components you can, can change how the uh, substance will crystallize as we saw here in this example. So most of the time you get to kinetic form, sometimes you get to kinetic and the thermodynamic form. This can be more than two, this is just an example of showing you the difference. So kinetic is very quick, thermodynamic may take a very long time. So polymorphs are another way you can enhance APS. And that comes about by using different types of crystallization techniques to see if you can get a different polymorph. So one is primitive, one is C-centered. So here, another type of way of enhancement of APIs is to form what's called a hydrate. And so what a hydrate means is that water molecules crystallize in the crystal lattice. So if you were growing your crystals out of water, there's a very high probability that water will co-crystallize in the crystal lattice. So therefore, you would have a hydrate structure. And so what we're looking at here is one of the several forms of hydrate, of, of carbon mesopine hydrates. And in this case, it's a dihydrate. And so what I've done here is the asymmetric unit is this right here. So I've, this is the asymmetric unit. On the other side, 
is the symmetry equivalent of the asymmetric unit. Now, before I answer what type of symmetry this is, if you look at this space group, CMCA, based on what we talked about all week, you should know what type of space group this is. A, you should know the crystal system, and B, you should know whether it's centro or non centro symmetric. And so, based on the fact that there are three perpendicular mirror planes, and when you take two mirror planes, you form a twofold, twofold rotation, this tells you that this space group, the maximum type of rotation it has is twofold. Because again, if you take two mirror planes, you generate a two-fold rotation or a screw axis if it's a glide plane. Secondly, there are three unique axes. So since there's three unique axes and the major or the most predominant type of rotational symmetry we have is two-fold, this is orth orthorhombic crystal system. Now the fact that it has three perpendicular mirror planes slash glide planes this tells you that it's centro symmetric. And so the way you get from this structure to this structure is you go through a inversion center. So when you invert N1, you get N1, the inverted form of N1. When you invert O1, you go through this point, you get the inverted form. Of O1. Just like with O2, when you go through this point, you get the inverted form of O2. And so that's the difference between these two structures is the one on the left is the inversion of the one on the right. So it's actually gone through an inversion point and to generate the other set of coordinates. Now, if you know the coordinates of N1 of the inversion in one of the uh, original, you can actually determine the what's called the centroid between the two points. And that'll tell you the coordinates of the inversion center. So you can actually use the uh, coordinates of each atom, the original atom and its inverted atom to determine where the inversion center is. So, so that was just a little side note for us. So now looking at the types of intermolecular forces that hold these uh, this co-crystal together, what you don't see, and this I was trying to display it on the structure, but there's hydrogen bonding between the nitrogen and the oxygen here. So again, you still form this hydrogen bonded dimer and since it's related by an inversion center this is called a centrosymmetric dimer because the two species are related through an inversion center so whenever you hear the word centrosymmetric dimer that's telling you that this dimer was made by incorporating inversion symmetry and the inversion center would be approximately somewhere right here. I don't know exactly where, but it would be somewhere in this location. And this is a very common motif formed between, formed in hydrogen bonding, especially with carboxylic acids. It's very common and it's a very strong intermolecular interaction. I wouldn't be surprised if this bond distance here was about 1.8 angstroms. Now, in addition, to this centrosymmetric dimer, you also have hydrogen bonding between the carbonyl oxygen and a water molecule, and also there's an interaction between the amine and a water molecule. So you get this extended interaction with the molecules. And so I tried to, to illustrate that interaction here. So the green represents the drug molecule. So you can see the drug molecules are forming that centrosymmetric dimer. What you see in between them is this ribbon of hydrogen bonding with the water molecules. 
So it kind of forms, these water molecules form like a square. Let me undo this. So if I show you the water molecules here, there's one, two, three, four. And you get like this ribbon of, it's actually called a ribbon of hydrogen bonding between the drug molecule and the waters. Now, this is the, what we refer to as the hydrophilic area. Because it means it likes water. And that's what you can see here. These waters form the hydrophilic area or hydrophilic layer. And then on the opposite side, you have this arrangement or this organization in the hydrophobic region. So you get this alternating between hydrophilic and hydrophobic portions of the crystal structure. And this is very common when you're talking about co-crystals. You have a hydrophilic part and you have a hydrophobic part. Now, if we were to look at this down a different view, because this is down the C-axis, if you were to look at it orthogonal to the C-axis, you would see that these form a channel of water molecules. So this is an example of enhancing APIs by forming a hydrate. So another way to enhance APIs is by forming solvates with the uh, drug molecule. Now, most often than not, especially with uh, uh, people doing research, sometimes solvate is a byproduct of what you're trying to crystallize, especially in the, uh, with the crystals, crystals that I deal with. Typically, the people, the researchers don't want solvent in it, but the way they crystallize it, the solvent comes with it because solvent helps stabilize the crystal lattice. So if there's like a big pore in the crystal, Usually you want a solvent, solvent usually goes in there to stabilize the crystal lattice. And so here, and I forgot the name of this drug, I think it's, uh, was it diethylformamide, for amide, is shown here. So this is the solvent here. And there are many different solvents that co-crystallize, I just picked one. So here's the solvent and this is the drug and so the, space group that this crystallizes in is P21 upon C and it has anti-epileptic -ep activity. Now P21 upon C, if we investigate this space group, it has two-fold rotation and it only has one unique axis. So since it only has two-fold rotation and one unique axis, it's going to be in the crystal system monoclinic. Now, since it has a two so one pair of uh, two so two one two so one upon C, is this going to be a centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric space group? And the answer is centrosymmetric because we have a screw axis and a glide plane or a mirror plane perpendicular to the rotational axis. So this is a monoclinic centrosymmetric space group. Now, viewing down the C axis, what we can see here is that we get this same hydrogen bonded dimer between the drug molecules. So this is a common motif that we see. And we get kind of like this zigzag, if you want to call it that. Let's see. So you get these dimers here, they kind of form a zigzag formation. Now these dimers are connected through the solvent molecule. So the solvent hydrogen bonds with these dimers to connect them in an extended chain. 
So the carbonyl on the solvent, hydrogen bonds with the NH2 group on the uh, drug, and you form these extended chain um, structures. So if I was to draw these extended chain structures, kind of highlight this. So if we start here, do, 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 do. Actually, stop, it's not extended chain because there's two water molecules. So there's no extended chain, it's just, uh, these two are two different solvent molecules, and they're both filling the void to hydrogen bond with the drug. Now, what you can see is that these cavities that is formed by the uh, centrosymmetric dimers is filled with the solvent. And a lot of times what, what the researchers do is they take these crystals that have the solvent incorporated in the lattice and see if they can find a temperature in which they can remove the solvent but retain the crystal structure. And then what you can do is once you remove the solvent by heating it to a certain temperature, you can replace it with another guest molecule, say another solvent or, for example, iodine or another type of a guest. And that's done quite a bit to get the actual framework of the lattice. You then evacuate the pores using, for example, heat, and then you can introduce another guest into the pore. And the way you know what temperature at which to uh, heat this up to remove the solvent is you do what's called TGA, thermal gravimetric analysis on a crystal, and it'll show you the temperature at which your solvent comes off. So there's a temperature at which the solvent comes off, and there's a temperature at which your structure decomposes. And so what you want to do is you want to use TGA to determine the temperature at which the solvent comes off. Then you can heat it up a little bit above that temperature to remove the solvent. And then you can actually grind up the crystal, or even if the crystal is still good quality, you can put it back on the diffractometer, recollect data, and see if the pores are... Uh, empty. Secondly, what you can do is after you heat it, you can grind up the sample, run x-ray powder on it, and you can determine if the powder patterns are the same or different. And then what they do is they usually incorporate another guest into this, maybe iodine or another type of solvent or any other type of guest molecule to fit inside that uh, pore. So again, you just hear the solvent helps enhance the drug. So this is a type of solvate. Another type of way of enhancing uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients is uh, making a salt of it and uh, there are many types of ways you can make a salt so you can replace the acid hydrogen on a metal or an acid hydrogen on an acid with a metal. So say for example, if we took oxalic acid, which is this, oh snap, it's not that, one second. Made a boo -boo. So oxalic acid is this. So if we took oxalic acid and then we replaced the acidic protons with maybe we use, say, a copper. So if we use copper, maybe it looks something like this. And copper is usually square planar or octahedral, so we'll just do that. 
And so this is replacing the acidic uh, hydrogen on an acid with a metal. So what you're doing is you're deprotonating the acid, throwing in a metal halide salt, for example. The metal coordinates with the uh, uh, deprotonated carbonyl or deprotonated hydroxy group, and you form a uh, metal oxygen coordination bond. And you can do this with not just metals. It can be, for example, uh, ammonium salts or an anion or a cation. So lots of different uh, ways to do this. But the active moiety is the same. You just form different salts. Now for the salt, the charge has to be balanced. So for example, in this structure here that I drew with copper and oxalic acid, you know, copper, if it's a two plus, and these are both negative, well then the charge is balanced, so these other uh, coordination bonds maybe are water. Because you always have to have a balanced neutral charge in a crystal for in most cases, unless it's a type of ionic crystal, which we're not going to cover. So charge has to remain balanced. So if we look at this crystal involving salt, or sodium, sorry. We see we have sodium here, and then we have five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five of the drug molecules coordinating to the sodium. So remember, sodium has a plus one charge. So since sodium has a plus one, we need a counter ion to balance the positive charge. And so what you see here is, you see we have triiodide, I3, and I3 is an anion. Which has a negative one charge. So here you see that the charge is conserved. So the, the metal is plus one, the anion is negative one, they balance out. This is a type of salt. Now if we look at the packing diagram, we see that the metal center is right here, but between these clusters, these metal clusters, we have these channels where the triiodide crystallize in. So again, this helps, the anion helps stabilizes the crystal structure. And the anion is important. You can talk to some professors in the chemistry department and when you try to crystallize different types of uh, structures, the anion is very important because if your anion is too small, it won't stabilize the crystal lattice. If your anion is too big, it won't fit in the cavity that it needs. So it's kind of like that story of the Goldilocks and the bears. You got to have the right temperature of porridge for her to eat it. You got to have the right size anion or cation, depending on what you're trying to do, to fill the voids in the lattice. So if it's too big, it won't work. If it's too small, it won't work. You got to find the right uh, size ion. Most of the time it's anions to fill the lattice void for your salt. So this is another way to enhance APIs is by making a salt of your drug molecule. And again, this is in space group P21 upon N. So again, two-fold symmetry, one unique axis, it's monoclinic. And since it's two one upon n, it's centro symmetric. However, the inversion center here is not on a uh, atomic position; it's some region of space, because this is the asymmetric unit on the left, and there's, it doesn't use symmetry to generate this. This is the whole asymmetric unit. So there's this inversion center somewhere out here in the space that is used to generate the centro, the inverted structure of the asymmetric unit.
And so just to kind of lead us into what we'll be talking a little bit about tomorrow is co-crystal preparation, preparation, sorry. And there are two ways to prepare uh, co-crystals. You can do it solution-based, which is, uh, you know, a large, a lot of people do it this way. I did it this way in grad school. Or you can do a solid-based approach as well. And so for solution base, we have solution crystallization. To give you kind of an example of this is you have your, your say your drug molecule and another co-crystal, maybe it's a carboxylic acid, you dissolve it in a solution. And then you maybe you do vapor diffusion where you diffuse another solvent into your solvent to make it an insoluble matrix so that your co-crystal crystallizes out. So that's one example. We also have solvent evaporation. So you dissolve your uh, drug molecule, you dissolve the co-crystal you want to use into a solvent, you set it, you let it evaporate. Now the key thing about this is that you have to find the right time of evaporation. You don't want it to evaporate too fast you'll just get powder. You don't want to evaporate too slow, it'll take forever. So there's a balance between how much time you need to make crystals. And the same thing with solvent crystallization, if you're using vapor diffusion, you want to pick a, a solvent when you diffuse it into your uh, mother liquor that has your drug molecule and co-crystal that it's not soluble in either one of them. So you have to pick an insoluble solvent to diffuse into the Solve it. Then we have isothermal slurry. So you have a solution, you put your other component in it, you make a slurry, and eventually the reaction occurs. And then we have what's referred to as a spray dryer. I'm not too familiar with this one, I haven't used it that much. Now, with a solid base, we can use a hot melt extraction, extrusion actually. So you heat it up, you melt it it forms the co-crystal. Another way, which is solid state grinding, you take your mole your drug molecule, you put in a co-crystal, you grind it up, and the mechanical grinding causes it to react. And I've actually done a little bit of this when dealing with halogen bonding. We would add a halogen to it and grind and see if, if there was a reaction taking place. And what you would do is, as you're grinding it, every, you know, certain amount of time goes by, you want to run a powder pattern on it to see if there's a difference in the powder pattern of your original, say, drug molecule and the grounded up mixture. And that tells you that there is a reaction occurring. So these are different ways to, you know, prepare code crystals. So again, with the crystal structure, you can enhance or change some of the physical properties, such as the crystal habit, what type of crystals are formed. Of course, the density, you can change solubility, a material uh, characteristics, and also the performance. So, for example, the bioavailability, maybe it's enhanced uh, by this formation of a co-crystal. So that concludes today's lecture on co-crystals. I'll stop here and if you have any questions, feel free to ask.